I realized that if I just help people, it's kind of the old Zig Ziglar thing. If you help people, then you're going to get more than what you uh, expect back. And all of a sudden, I just had money flowing to me. So my obsession with money became an obsession with freedom. And, and, and now I would tell you money gives you choices, choices give you freedom. And so what most people do because they're exchanging time for money, they, they equate money to their lives and, and that's how they measure their worth, right? I believe everybody can do it at some level, right? And I've had people start with $20,000. I've had people start with millions of dollars because it is about banking. There's two different types of loans and two different, really, there's two insurance companies in the country that allow you to take either type of loan. There's one called direct recognition, and it's a fixed uh, interest rate. So Welcome to the Global Investor Podcast, a show that focuses on helping foreign investors enter the lucrative U.S. real estate market. Host Charles Carrillo combines decades of real estate investing experience with a professional background in international banking to interview experts in all areas of U.S. real estate investing. Now, here's your host, Charles Carrillo. Welcome to another episode of the Global Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Charles Carrillo. Today, we have Jim Oliver. He founded Create Tailwind in 1988, a financial firm that now focuses on infinite banking concept of being your own banker, a unique investment strategy that helps certain individuals minimize taxes and interest expenses. Jim himself has utilized the strategy to start and purchase over 30 companies himself. So thank you so much for coming on the show today, Jim. Thank you, Charles. Thanks for having me. And I look forward to spending some time with the audience. Yes, yes. This is a topic that we don't talk about much. Um, I think it's been years since we've had a professional on to talk about infinite banking and being your own banker. So before we get into everything uh, encompassing that, can you give us a little background about yourself, both uh, personally and professionally, prior to getting involved with alternative investments and infinite banking? Yeah. So um, I grew up in Los Angeles. I grew up in the inner city of Los Angeles and I was fascinated with people that lived in really nice neighborhoods and had seemed to have endless amounts of money in my um, narrow point of view. And I thought they have a perfect life living in, say, Palos Verdes, for example, in Los Angeles. And I was living in Inglewood and I thought, what do they know that the people that live here don't know? I thought it had to be they had to know about money. They had to know how money works. So I was always fascinated with that. So when I went to school, I studied business so that I could start learning about money. And then I got out of school. I went to, and got uh, a position as a fee-based financial babysitter. I mean, a financial <laughs> planner. And, um, and I thought, now I'm going to learn about money. I'm going to learn about how to invest money. But no, I was just a middleman. But I was a pretty good middleman. I had $700 million under management at one point in time. And I thought, you know what? This is pretty easy. I just got to take everybody to lunch, take them to play golf. This is, this is my life. But then I got this report one day, Charles, and it said that our clients for this period of time got 9.38% on their money. And I thought, it doesn't seem like my, I mean, I have money in that account. It doesn't seem like we got 9.38%. So I went and I looked at the net after taxes, fees, um, uh, everything. And it was like, oh, wait a minute. That's like 4%. That, that, that doesn't make sense. Why are we telling everybody they're getting 9.38%? They're not really getting that. Um, and so I started diving into how my clients made money. And I went, wait a minute. What I'm doing is not what they need to be doing. And it's not how they made their money. And, and so by chance, I ran into... Nelson Nash, he was doing a 10 hour course on infinite banking, becoming your own banker. And I thought, become my own banker. That sounds kind of cool. I, yeah, I want to be my own banker. And I went to his, his course in Texas and I was like, this guy's either brilliant or he's crazy. And I wasn't sure which one. And so I, he said, Hey, I asked him a bunch of questions after the seminar. He was very gracious and he just answered all my questions. He was in his late seventies at the time and he had just spoken for like, six hours straight. And he said, Hey, I'm doing this again in two weeks. Come back. It'll make more sense the second time through. So I did. And about halfway through, I had this aha moment, like, wait a minute, you finance every single thing that you buy. You either pay interest or you give up interest you could have earned somewhere else. And if I could eliminate that problem for people, 
i.e. they could become their own banker, what an impact that would have on their wealth. So maybe I should focus on that, not on what they're going to do with their money, where they're going to invest it. I mean, I don't, whether it's in the stock market, real estate, um, hard money, I mean, lending, I've, I've seen everything that you can imagine, right? I'll focus on controlling the money pool. And that's kind of how I got into infinite banking. And, and I kind of see it as a ledger, right? The money pool is on the left side of the ledger and the assets. And I know that'll drive uh, CPAs <laughs> and accounting majors crazy, but the assets are on the right side of the ledger, right? And the reason I keep it like that is because I want you to think about this differently and backwards, but I'm just going to show you how to control the money. And then what you do with the money is, is, you know, that's, that's up to you, what you know, or what you, who you can partner with or whatever. So can you give us like an overview of what infinite banking is? Um, I think people have heard it a lot and I think it, it's something that's marketed with many different uh, names and um, kind of specialties, depending on who they're trying to attract. Yeah. So infinite banking, the way that most people explain infinite banking is during your lifetime, you're going to spend a lot of money on interest, financing cars and credit cards and um, other debt. Um, some people say mortgages, but, you know, I kind of would argue that, too, just uh, especially uh, in the last few years where mortgage rates were. But if the average person pays 40 percent of their net income to interest. And, and, and we all know that the biggest reason for that is the mortgage, right? In the beginning, 85% or more goes towards interest. And so that's why. And it's volume of interest, not interest rate. So every dollar you earn, 40 cents goes to interest. Well, so these, you know, people say you need to start financing your own cars and all this stuff. That's not really what we do, Charles, with infinite banking. That's kind of how it got its start. But what Nelson did is Nelson explained to me how he bought this airplane with some partners. Mm -hmm. And then when they weren't using it, they leased it out. And it was a cash flowing asset. And I said, oh, OK, that's infinite. That's what I got excited about with infinite banking is I can put money in this insurance contract, this very specially designed insurance contract. It's guaranteed to grow every single day. And I buy it from a mutual insurance company. So in, as mutual insurance companies are owned by policyholders, right? Not shareholders. And insurance companies are required to distribute the profits to the owners, policyholders in the form of a dividend. So, um, and so what happens is you have this money sitting in this account. And because you have that money and because you're an owner, you have a contractual right to take an interest only loan at between four and 5% even today of the insurance company's money. Your money never leaves that account. It's in there guaranteed, growing tax-free, guaranteed every single day. The insurance company has to give you their money. They collateralize your account so that's safe for them. They are gonna charge you four or 5% and interest only, right? So now you take the insurance company's money, other people's money, you have use and control of that, and you go buy assets or you go buy funds or you go buy whatever is your specialty or who you've partnered with. And when those things earn money, you flow it back into the insurance contract and you rinse and repeat. So if it was real estate, I see this a lot with doctors. Doctors have they don't have time for real estate. So they partner with somebody. They, they're a passive investor in a real estate fund or something mm -hmm. like that. And as money comes back in, they don't need it to buy their groceries so they flow it back into another investment, another investment, another investment. They create what I call velocity of money, not like velocity in science, but velocity of money, moving your money faster and faster and faster. So when you do that, buy these cash flowing assets, have this money pool. After a while, your investments are paying your premiums. And after a while, you put a dollar into the insurance contract and you have more than a dollar to go put into these investments. Then you have, now you have other people's money, you have use and control, and you have leverage. Because if I can put in a dollar and I have a dollar 50 to go put into the investment, I win. So then I just do that over and over and over again. So the, the insurance contract is never about the investment or the rate of return on the insurance contract. It's about the rights as, uh, as, an, a, as a policy holder or policy owner and the intrinsic value of the insurance contract. 
that's what it becomes about. So when you're speaking to professionals and um, I imagine business owners, this is, is this a strategy that is usually utilized by um, high income earners and entrepreneurs? I mean, who, who is your, I guess your, um, your target audience for this type of product? I believe everybody can do it at some level, right? And I've had people start with $20,000. I've had people start with millions of dollars because it is about banking. And so if you think about like how a bank works is you have a depositor, they go down and they deposit money in the bank. Then that bank lends the money to a borrower, right? And then the borrower pays interest and then the bank pays the depositor as little interest as possible. You do the same kind of thing, right? And so if you started with 20,000 and you wanted to finance a vacation or pay off a credit card or a student loan or something like that, you could do it. If you, in business, when you look at the business cycle, most businesses use a bank, right? And they use a bank because they're, 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 uh, the money flowing in sometimes is seasonal and the money flowing out tends to not be as seasonal, yeah. more level, and the money coming in is up and down. So they use a bank and a line of credit. This is like using your own bank and using it for equipment and vehicles and could be trucks, it could be anything else. And in Nelson Nash's book, who's kind of the godfather, this has always been around and wealthy people have always used this. Nelson really brought it down to the everyday person's uh, level. Um, and Nelson gives an example of somebody financing their landscaping trucks. And over their career, they end up with $2 million more by financing those trucks themselves than if they would have financed it through the finance company. So... Anybody can do it. The more money you have, the more benefit I think you get and the more options you get. And if you're a business owner and you're borrowing money, then definitely you can benefit from it. So what I've read before on this when doing my limited research was that uh, there's usually some sort of time set time period um, between the time I open an account to the time that I can borrow against it. Can you talk to more about how that works? Yeah. So the companies that, so there's, you know, there's a bunch of different mutual insurance companies out there. They're all investing in the same thing. They all have the same reinsurance treaties or similar treaties. And, um, and they're all working with the same numbers, right? The same mortality and everything else. So what we do is we look for companies that don't let you quote season the money, like for right. a year or whatever. We literally can get people loans, um, a week, two weeks after they deposit money in, in the account. So, you know, I don't want them to wait. Um, some companies require you to wait a year to take a loan. I don't want to do that. You want your money moving. You know, motion is the law of God. If air, you know, air has got to flow in and out of our bodies. Blood has to flow through our bodies. Money's got to flow. What are the costs usually associated with someone coming in to open one of these accounts and maintain it over um, several years? Yeah, so, you know, the costs are it's an insurance contract. So when you have two different components, you have the whole life policy, and then you have this rider called the paid up additions rider. The paid up additions is dollar for dollar. It's always dollar for dollar. There's literally in the, in the companies that we use, there's literally no fees in that, right? It's on the life insurance side. So let's say 60% was going into the PUA and 40% is going into the whole life policy on that 40%. In the very beginning, you have setup costs and underwriting costs and commissions and all of that in that first year. So that's why Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman don't like whole life insurance is because they look at that first year, you put in a dollar and you have not much to use, right? In that first year. The second year, the, again, the companies we use, the second year, it's like 95% of what you put in. So if I put in a hundred grand, I have $95,000 and it's only... I only have a little bit of a cash drag of five grand. Um, the first year it might be, I put in a hundred grand and I have like 60 or 65, but, and there are people out there that advocate to reduce, add a term rider, reduce the, um, the base whole life policy down to 10 or 20% and have more of that paid up additions, which is just dollar for dollar. But that's a better way to start first, but that's not the better way to finish first because what happens is that whole life policy, once it kind of gets up and running, takes a couple of years, every dollar you put in there, you have more than a dollar to go use, right? right? 
Now, if it's just sitting there, like, like certain companies want you to sit it there and park it there for 20, 30, 40 years, then, yeah, then you could say, I put in this amount of money. This is what it's worth. That's my rate of return. But if I'm taking it and using the insurance company's money, then it's whatever it's returning in there, which is, you know, it's small. It's, it's, it's guaranteed. It's cash. It's what I'm doing with their mm -hmm. money. That's where the return is. You know, like if I take a uh, hundred thousand dollars and I had 95 to use and I take and I give you the $95,000 and I say, Charles, go invest that money for me and you get me 20%. Well, I don't care that the insurance contract got three or 3.6. I don't really care about that, right? I mean, three or 3.6, who cares? I got 20 on this side, or I got 12 on this side, or 10 or eight or whatever it is. So um, um, so then as that money comes back in and it's going and it's flowing, I have more and more and more an ever increasing money pool to go put money in the investment. But by year, like say year 10, okay? If I put in a dollar, I have a dollar 50 to go use. And that's if I did no infinite banking. I just have the insurance contract. Well, so you, if if you wrote me, if I write, if you wrote me a check for a hundred grand, and I turn around and wrote you one for one hundred and fifty, you'd be okay with that, right? And you're going to go invest it. By the way, if I made you that deal and that was the ratio, do you want that first check to be big, the one you're going to write me? Do you want it to be big or small? I want that the one to write to you small. No, you want it to be big because I'm going to write you a bigger one, right? It's going to be 50% more. So you're going to be like, hey, Jim, can I write you a check for 10 million? And then you write me one back for 15. Gotcha. So the way to look at this loan too, Charles, is kind of like this, is if I would loan you today $100 million and your only obligation is one year from today, you got to pay me $5 million of interest, would you take the loan? Yes. Absolutely, right? Okay, so like if you did that with me, I'm going to take your 100 million, I'm going to go borrow 400 million from the seller or the bank, and I'm going to buy a $500 million business. Okay. And now when I do that kind of investing, I want to get 25% cash on cash. So I, your, 20, your 100 million, I want to net after debt load 25 million bucks. So I call you in a year and I say, Charles, I've got your, uh, I've got your check for $5 million of interest. Right. And I'd like to I'd like to drive over Alligator Alley and uh, give you your check and take you to to uh, uh, prime uh, prime fish. OK. Uh, and you say, hey, I love that restaurant. And so we go to dinner and I hand you your check and you say, Jim, do you want to pay any principal? And I say, nope. See you next year. Right. That's the kind of loan that you're getting from the insurance contract. Your only obligation is to pay the interest at the end of the year. They don't ask you what you're doing with it. They can't say no. Um, they, you don't have to even have an, uh, a payment, anything else. You just pay the interest at the end of the year. Interesting. Very good. Yeah. So what is the, what is the time frame from the time that I want to access funds to the time that I can withdraw it? A um, couple of days. Yeah. I mean, some companies, when I say that we can get things rushed, some companies are up to five business days. It just depends on what time of the year. Is it around tax time? Because people use you know, their insurance contracts to pay taxes, things like that. Do you have money sitting in the stock market and you're worried about it? Or worse, you have money sitting at the bank, not keeping up with inflation? My name is Charles Carrillo, founder and managing partner of Harborside Partners. And since 2006, I've been investing my money and my family's money into income-producing properties. These are real assets, real properties with real addresses that produce real cash flow. At Harborside Partners, we provide passive investors who love real estate with a turnkey investing solution. If you want to put your money to work in real estate but can't find deals, don't have the time to get funding, and the last thing that productive people want to do is manage real estate. We find the deals, we fund the deals, and we manage the tenants, the termites, and the properties. Partner with us at investwithharborside.com. That's investwithharborside.com. Go to investwithharborside.com. If you love real estate, you like the idea of passive income, and believe that income-producing properties will appreciate over time, go to investwithharborside.com. That's investwithharborside.com. And what happens uh, when someone passes away with, depending if they have money that's out already, and they have these two different contracts. I mean, how does that work with with your heirs? Yeah, it's great. No, that's a great question, Charles. Um, is what happens is if they pass away 
and they're say, let's say they had a $3 million uh, death benefit and they had a million dollar loan, right? So that loan is wiped out and their family would get $2 million tax free. Interesting. Okay. Wow. That's very powerful. Um, it's, it's interesting because I've never gotten involved with infinite banking, but, um, you know, with one of my brokerage accounts, I have it and it's like, you know, we you can pull money out and it's literally like overnight. It's a similar like strategy. And, um, obviously there is no life insurance portion with that. And obviously you're invested into, you know, depending on what you're investing into, that can be not guaranteed. Right. So. There's, yep. you know, there's different things for people that have different, you know, risk tolerances for where they're putting their money to be able to access it at, you know, lower than what most people are going to be able to access their funds at. Um, but let's talk about that for a second. So you're saying that interest rates that you we were talking, you were throwing out like four or five. And I, I mean, what, what is it like a typical interest rate now? And does it work with, is it like a sliding scale? The more I take out, it's just a little lower. How does that work? Yeah, so there's there's two different types of loans and two different really there's two insurance companies in the country that allow you to take either type of loan. There's one called direct recognition and it's a fixed uh interest rate. So it's 4% fixed. And but it reduces your um uh it reduces your dividend by point uh by 50 okay. basis points. Okay? Or there's a non-direct recognition loan, which is variable. So right now, and it's at only at 5.2%, and it doesn't affect your dividend. So depending on what the dividend is paying, what year you are in the insurance contract, all of those things go into factors uh, are factored in to say, okay, if I if I take the direct recognition or the non-direct recognition, which one is better? And and so you can take. That's the that's the range right now on on loans and um, um, you know Nelson Nash when he when he kind of discovered this for himself it was in 1980 and he was paying 23 percent on a half a million dollars and he looked at his insurance contract and he could have and he could take a loan for eight percent at that time wow. and he was like wait a minute why would I have these loans with the bank when I could have a loan to the insurance contract company for eight? And he did it and he took the loan and it saved his real estate portfolio. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. That is a huge savings in interest there. So you're bringing around a lot of alternative investments. You were in the traditional realm, let's say, um, for many years. And now you're uh, more of a, I would say, alternative investor. You work with a lot of alternative investors because I imagine people that are taking money out of these accounts are not investing into stocks mainly. I imagine it's into businesses and or whatever they want. But I, I imagine it's more alternative investments from the people I've spoken to that utilize mm -hmm. this strategy. What are some common mistakes that maybe you've seen um, real estate investors make or any type of investor make before that maybe you've worked with uh, that's worked with in infinite banking? Yeah, the, the mistake that I see sometimes is people just they don't take loans. They just put the money in the insurance contract and then they don't they don't use it and go make right. those investments. So that's probably the most common thing that happens. Right. But then if they do go make those loans, they sometimes they don't know who to partner with. And so they, you know, they, they, I've seen people make mistakes and partner with people they, they shouldn't have partnered with. Right. Or, um, I see people take it and, um, borrow it out for something and they don't pay themselves back or they don't flow the money back in so they can use it over and over again. So they don't get that velocity of money, get that money moving, or, um, they don't pay themselves a high enough interest. Those are probably the most common mistakes. And, Honestly, a lot of people make mistakes along the way or, hey, I could have done that better, but that's kind of a learning curve just like anything else. But in alternative investments, like you said, like real estate, well, right now, a lot of people are like, well, real estate isn't where to put, you know, I don't want to buy real estate. Well, I'm, you know, there, maybe I don't want to buy certain types of real estate. Maybe I don't want to finance multifamily, but, you know, RV parks, there's, uh, you know, subject to there's like there's lots of things that you can be doing. But if you go back to the richest man in Babylon, one of the tenants is invest in what you know. So if I'm a dentist and I lease my uh, operatories, I think that's what they're called, um, is, uh, is, you know, my, my TV screen and the equipment and the chair, normally they lease that for around 12% or so, maybe 15% now. 
And it's the volume of interest is much higher on that because they're going to do four or five year uh, lease. So they might be paying 25% of every dollar that they're paying goes to interest. Well, I'll finance those if I'm the dentist and I'll finance my building and I'll finance the, you know, other things, the remodel, whatever it is. Right. So there are things that you just naturally would use your own bank for. Yeah. So that's a great example. Um, yeah. That's probably one of the most important investing strategies or thoughts is just investing in what you understand. Cause there's so many people that. I've spoken to before that have lost money in investments and you know, when speaking to them, they don't understand it. You don't want to put anybody on the spot. Right. But some people will say, right. it, you know what I mean? But some people will, they'll just, you just know, they don't know what they're, what they were investing into. And that is like yeah. a huge red flag. So for someone that sees your equipment every day, I love that. That's great because that's actually, you know, that's, that's a win-win for everybody. Yeah. So over 35 years in the financial, personal financial space, uh, I mean, how has your relationship towards money changed over those those years? Yeah, you know, I mean, I used to, like I said, when I was poor and I didn't have money, I was obsessed with it. And what I realized is the more that I was obsessed with it, the less that it flowed to me, right? Now, when I focus on serving other people and helping other people, that's how I ended up with these businesses because it would be well, this person is having this problem or this problem. I've seen that before. You know, it's like anything else. Once you've done it a few times, it's like, oh, you have a, you know, you have a, a, a 112 problem, yeah. you know, like you have, you know, you have, you know, this is the, there's only so many problems. This is yours. Right. And so um, I realized that if I just help people, it's kind of the old Zig Ziglar thing. If you help people, then you're going to get more than what you uh, expect back. And all of a sudden I just had money flowing to me. So m my obsession with money became an obsession with freedom. And, in and now I would tell you money gives you choices, choices give you freedom. And so what most people do because they're exchanging time for money, they, they equate money to their lives and, and that's how they measure their worth, right? We say your net worth is x right well once you have your net worth to a certain point it's more like what's your impact what's your contribution what's your and the more that you focus on impact and contribution and serving you your net worth goes up and up and up um way more than if you focus on hey i gotta go make some money yeah if you when, it, when i speak to people that are potentially investors and when you're really talking to them um if they're gonna be active or passive and um it's really the freedom. I mean, it's all, it's, it always comes, you can always boil it down to getting to the freedom. It's no one wants like a ton of money in their bank account. It's really, I want the freedom, you know, and the autonomy to do what I want, all, you know, what I want, all this kind of stuff. So um, it's very, it's very true. Um, so one thing we didn't talk about, Jim, that I thought would be kind of best to leave in your court is that you have a new book. You sent me out a preview of it. Um, a lot of interesting information in there. I, uh, I read some of the chapters, uh, some of the highlights, some of the chapters. Um, so tell us about your book and tell us about, uh, you know, everything that you've put in there. Yeah. So here's the, here's a copy of the book, the pre, uh, it's, uh, you know, make bank without the bank and, you know, the title Charles, you know, when, when, when we're, especially depends on where we're from, that's why I'm smiling because, you know, depending on where you're from, your slang for money could be a lot of different things. Right. And I think it's funny because depending on where you grew up, that's, that's what you call it. And so we would always say, man, I'm going to make bank, you know, like, uh, and so, and, the, and so then it, with infinite banking, it was like make bank without the bank, but it starts off and it, and it tells kind of a story of my childhood being poor. And I worked in this uh, casket factory and I 13 years old, I literally built the hardware for caskets. And um, there was a guy that owned it, Dwayne McIntyre. And I thought, man, you know, he just walks around. He's not here that much. I mean, what's he doing? I mean, he's the owner. Shouldn't he be running this business? And, you know, he had people running the business. I'm swinging a hammer all day long. And then one day I'm in Inglewood. I was like, thir again, I was like 13 that summer. And I'm walking down the street with a friend of mine. I look down and this guy's pulling weeds. And I, wait a minute, that's Dwayne McIntyre. Um, you know, Mr. McIntyre, what are you doing here? And he goes, oh, I own this house. So like, look, but I'd love to tell you at 13 years old, this was like a light bulb going off for me, Charles, 
but it was like 20 years later. Okay. I'm not, I, I went to public school. I'm not that bright. I mean, uh, it was like, but 20 years later, it was like a light bulb went off. So in the book, I talk about everything I needed to know. I, I learned then, right? He was, he owned businesses, real estate, and it wasn't in Palos Verdes where he lived. So in my book, I just tell the story about how I learned about money and that basically I grew up with nothing. So if I can do it, you can do it. And, and, and I just kind of talk about a little bit in the first couple of chapters, my journey, and then I get into it. And the book's 98 pages. I mean, it's a quick read. I wanted it to be, you know, I'm not trying to tell everybody everything about money. I'm just trying to give you some things to think about and some concepts to like start your journey. And so that's, that's really what the book is about. And um, um, there's an audible version that we kind of, we took away from uh, David Goggins where somebody else reads the, the chapter and then they interview me afterwards. And, uh, and that was a lot of fun to put together. Very too. cool. Very cool. Yeah. It's interesting uh, when you're getting um, advice from older people and you're younger and you don't really know what to make of it. Not that you could have, you don't really have any experience in the world. And then you look back on, you're like, oh yeah, that's person actually knew they're doing. This is exactly how it works. And uh, that was really good advice. I just didn't know what to do with that at that time. But thank goodness yeah. I got it. Right. I mean, like sooner or later, it's like people say, I wish I would have known about infinite banking when I was in my twenties. Yeah, me yeah. too. <laughs> yes. So how can our listeners learn more about uh, you, get your book and uh, get in touch with you for uh, your business? Yeah. So go uh, create tailwind.com is our website. Um, you could email me, Jim Oliver at create tailwind, all one word.com. Or you can go to community.createtailwind.com or go on the Apple store or Android store and just search create tailwind, all one word. We have a community that has, it's got free courses on there. You can learn everything that you would want to know about infinite banking. And one of the things that I'd like to do, Charles, is if anybody reaches out to me directly and they, and they say they heard me on your show, I'd love to send you a copy of, I'll give you your choice, either my book or um, Nelson Nash's book on how to become your own bank. Great. Well, thank you so much. And I, I bet some of our uh, listeners will take you up on that. So uh, thanks so much for coming on today, Jim, and letting us know about uh, infinite banking and looking forward to connecting with you here in the near future. Thank you, Charles. Thanks for having me. And thank you, audience. Hi, guys. It's Charles from the Global Investors Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're interested in getting involved with real estate, but you don't know where to begin, set up a free 30-minute strategy call with me at ScheduleCharles.com. That's ScheduleCharles.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Global Investor Podcast. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play to get new weekly episodes. For more resources and to receive our newsletter, please visit globalinvestorpodcast.com. And don't forget to join us next week for another episode. Nothing in this episode should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Any investment opportunities mentioned on this podcast are limited to accredited investors. Any investments will only be made with proper disclosure, subscription documentation, and are subject to all applicable laws. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Syndication Superstars, LLC, exclusively.